Hey, welcome to this episode of The Complete Advisor. So happy that you are here. Uh, you know, one of the big challenges that you face as a small business owner, it's hiring. Uh, you know, and it, it's just, it's almost become a minefield. There's so many things you need to be mindful of. There are so many things you need to take into consideration. And I would say that as a small business owner, it is crucial that you get hiring right because a bad hire can really impact your business uh, and the relationships that you have. Today, uh, we've got a special guest. It is uh, Kelly Rice. She is the HR director here at Creative One. And we're gonna have a conversation around hiring, do's and don'ts, things to watch out for, tips and tricks. You're gonna love it. Um, I'd love to hear what you have to say, so please feel free to jot some things in the comments, shoot me an email, I'd love to know. Uh, with that being said, let's join the conversation. So we're gonna talk about hiring, uh, an area that I know gives people a lot of fits. And if it's not done correctly, um, causes a lot of problems and a lot of issues and, it, and it's hard. And you know, we keep hearing all the time about the labor market being, uh, you know, where have all the good, where have all the cowboys gone? You know, where, where are all the good uh, candidates? And we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but you know, so Kelly, one of the first things, um, let's talk a little bit about your bona fides. So you've been in HR for, you, we got you right out of college, so a year or two maybe, or? I spent most of my career in human resources. I actually started uh, working in customer service, though, uh, and so that's kind of where I learned um, the backbones of the annuity and insurance business. You know, working on the front lines on the on the phone unit, as we called it <laughs> at the time. Um, you know, just to provide some some background to how the business works. But I moved into human resources. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been about twenty seven years. You know, I did not know that about you. That you, uh, and that's something that I think is really helpful to this. To, to our conversation is that you know our you you know this world, um, and I didn't know that you knew it from that level. So look at that, we're already learning, right? Hey. Uh, uh, so being on the phones, that is a uh, that's the school of hard knocks right there. Yeah, it was a good opportunity to kind of get my feet wet to start to understand the business, to mm -hmm. understand who our customer is, mm -hmm. and I think you know as you're kind of thinking about your business and you know what do you need to do in the next steps of your business. Obviously, you know who your customer is, but anybody that you want to bring into your organization, you want them to understand that with pretty great clarity as well. Yeah. So you've had the experience, you, you by by knowing the customer, I know that you've worked with some advisors, helping them and guiding them a little bit on HR questions and hiring, but then you've hired for us sure. uh, and for other companies that you've worked at. What do you see just right off the, right off the cuff? What are the big differences there? You know, I think that, um, you know, for us as an organization at Creative One, when we're hiring folks, we, you know, we're a little bit larger organization, but we're not a huge organization. And so, you know, we've got a, a smaller corporate culture here, mm -hmm. um, but larger than what a lot of our advisors have. And so I think when you look at bringing someone into your business, particularly as a financial advisor, there's a little bit deeper level of understanding um, of that person that you probably need to have in terms of trust and mm -hmm. feeling like, because this is going to be somebody who's going to be very front pa facing um, to your business. Mm -hmm. You know, you want them to know your customer. You also want them to have the best interest of your organization in mind. We want that too at this organization, obviously, but I think that relationship has a little bit of a different dynamic as a financial advisor because mm -hmm. it's your own business. When we hire, or at a bigger company, you hire the impact of a bad hire is not maybe as dramatic because there's other people probably in the department you hired them in. So if you've got somebody who is, for lack of better words, uh, we'll just call them a bad, a, maybe a bad hire, wrong hire, yeah. wrong hire. Um, you hire somebody a wrong hire, they don't fit the damage that they could, the impact, negative impact they could have it would be much less than if I'm an advisor and I'm hiring an assistant and all my clients and all my prospects are seeing this one person, stakes are higher. It can be. Yeah. You know, certainly from, from our organizational standpoint, we always try to be very diligent in that process too because whether you're a small organization or a large organization, bringing someone into the org that isn't really the right fit costs mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you want to get that right, you know. But in a, in a smaller organization, people may be wearing more than one hat. Yeah. And so, you know, trying to really nail that fit uh, is as is, is critical as it, you know, can be in terms of helping with the growth of your business. That said, 
mistakes are sometimes going to happen. There we go. Okay, so um, maybe f- step one, and this is this is maybe an unfair question for you, but when should an advisor? Do you have any rule of thumb for an advisor of when they should look to hire? So I think there's all the pieces around looking at your growth strategy. What are you trying to do from a numbers perspective? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, whether it's AUM or looking at other, um, you know, dollars to your portfolio, et cetera, clientele. Um, But, you know, when you are looking from a financial advisor perspective, oftentimes it's really what, what would bringing someone additional into your business do in terms of freeing your time? Mm-hmm. and allowing you to stretch to some other things and, and really grow your business. And so I think, you know, when when a financial advisor is contemplating when's the right time for me to bring someone into that growth, you have to think about what you're going to have to pay that person, certainly to make that happen. But mm-hmm. what could that, you know, offer you in terms of an opportunity to grow further? Yeah, you can't look at it just from the, oh my gosh, I'm spending this much. Right. And I know that uh, one of our advisors that we've had on the podcast, uh, I'm going to name drop Mark Roberts here, uh, he always makes a point when he talks to other advisors, because he gets asked about hiring because he's got a big staff, but he always makes that point you can't look at if you're going to pay somebody a salary of, um, let's say, $36,000 for easy, super easy math. Um, you can't look at that person and think, holy smokes, I've got to pay 36000 It's break it down, and that's 3000 a month. Did I did the math right? Yeah, I did the math right. Uh, it's 3000 a month instead of this big chunk all right. at once. Right, and how is putting that p- person into position ultimately going to be something you can leverage to mm-hmm. gain more time? to, you know, maybe increase, you know, the outreach in terms of customer service to your clientele. What is that going to do that's really going to free up space for the advisor to grow that business? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go in. First question I have for you is, where do we find the right people? So, you know, we're still dealing in a post-pandemic kind of a world. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, COVID did change a lot of things, but we've probably kind of gotten a little bit back to some middle ground um, but definitely, you know, pre-COVID, post-COVID, Indeed, LinkedIn are very good places to go out and, and source for candidates. You've got the ability then to put it out there immediately to canvas a pretty large area in which you're going to have people looking at your information. And you can budget in different ways to get your listing to the top. Mm-hmm. And so there's some strategy there in terms of how you go uh, and advertise. But, you know, Putting an ad on Indeed is really a fairly simple thing to do. Um, you you first have to have the job description, and that is really where you know we we tend to encourage people to start um, drafting that job description, what you want the essential duties for for that position to accomplish. Um, starts to sort of formulate your your plan in terms of what role do you really need to hire for? You know, do mm-hmm. you need somebody who's going to be a receptionist? Do you need somebody who's going to be an operations specialist? Um, do you need someone who's going to be a, 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 a metrics analyst? Um, so, you know, just kind of thinking about what you want them to do that is going to help you enhance your business and maximize your time. Now, I've never, I've never done that, um, put, toge- like put together a, a job description. Do you get, when, when an advisor is doing this, do they, should they be super descriptive? Should they, are there, there's probably templates out there, I imagine. There's a lot of templates out there. We can help with those templates. I mean, you would be surprised what's out there on the World Wide Web, right, <laughs> that if you just go do a search, um, you'll be able to find, you know, and, and really then hone into those mm-hmm. critical critical duties that um, that you think are going to, again, it's really about you and maximizing your time as a financial advisor. Um, and so there's there are um, definitely already created. It's mm-hmm. this is not something where you have to go recreate the wheel. How important is so you mentioned something and this this popped in my head because I, I've I've seen some memes and such about it where um, somebody will show the job description. And then it'll say um, uh, it'll it'll say like years of experience or years of experience, and then maybe licenses and stuff. But it doesn't match up with um, uh, it doesn't match up maybe with the salary or you know it's an entry level position, but they want six years of experience or things like that. Is that a is that a common mistake? Is that have you seen that? So it's it's a common mistake, except that um, you know. You, you hone into what you want, and then you mm-hmm. think about, you know, okay, how much experience do I really want? Do I want to train somebody new? Yeah. Or, um, or, or do I want them to come with all of the bona fide 
qualifications. Quite frankly, most financial advisors have their own approach to how they're handling their mm-hmm. business. You know, whether you you work with a, a management system, a CRM or, or not, um, you may have some individual requirements in your office. Um, we, you can, we can try to help you align those things so that um, not only are you um, looking at what you need as far as critical skills, but also being realistic. And and part of that is also being realistic about what the market looks like. Sure. Um, you know, and, and what it's going to cost you to bring in somebody with that level of experience. And do you really need that? Speaking of levels of experience and costing, are there, where does one look to get an idea of this position pay uh, to be, to be in the, in the running for good sure. candidates? How do you, how do you find that out? So if you actually go to Indeed, you can do a search and pull up client support specialists, for instance. You can look at job descriptions out there. You can look at your competitor companies. Um, You'll be able to get an an assessment um, of of probably where the compensation is going to lie, what maybe they're looking for in terms of specific credentials, if they're looking for someone who's 65 certified or something like that. Um, So also Glassdoor is a great uh, Mm -hmm. resource Mm -hmm. that -hmm. will also give you some comparable um, compensation pieces. Um, You've got some states out there, such as the state of Colorado, that is now requiring that uh, employers post the the salary range. That's a new law. And so... Can you wiggle around that? Because I I was reading something about, like, New York has that. And so they had the salary range. But isn't it isn't it like people are putting, like, you know... You can have a pretty wide range, you know. But, I mean... If you're really trying to attract a candidate, mm-hmm. um, you you may you know have a range that you're going to use because somebody more qualified may demand a higher compensation level. But I think you really want to – anything that you advertise, you want to advertise that in the spirit of, I'm looking for the best candidate. That's a good point. Right? You That's don't want to limit point. your exposure or even your mindset to, I'm only going to pay this much. If, you know, there's somebody out there who may be a really good candidate for you that's going to cost a little more, but ultimately will bring more value mm-hmm. to your business. Mm-hmm. That's a good point because I could see I, I'm a, a little bit of a cheapskate. And so I could see myself almost – you'd almost be shooting yourself in the foot by like low balling and finding, you know, the, the lowest right. price you could pay for that – for somebody to help you out. And, and then you're – how can you be surprised if, you know, the talent isn't that great? It's, you have to give and take a little bit, you know, um, you're, you're going to get what the market has to bear and, Mm -hmm. um, hopefully you're going to find a solid stellar candidate who's going to be great for you. But, you know, you also have to be reasonable in terms of the market may not give you that. And Mm -hmm. so are you willing to wait for it or do you need to, you know, kind of assess your criteria? I think just not going in with an absolute, you know, uh, preformed description of who yeah. that person is going to be. I mean, really look at terms of what the qualifications are, are coming with them. Do you see a lot of folks that when when somebody makes the ultimate hire decision, are you seeing a lot of folks coming off the Indeed and, and those different, like, is Monster still a thing? I don't know if that's still It a... is, but not probably as prevalent. Okay. So off the, off the website generated things versus, hey, I got, a, I got somebody. Yeah, I I think that um, you know the the gold standard almost has become like an Indeed or a LinkedIn um, again because it allows you to canvas and there is just such a a, a huge um, resource mm-hmm. uh, out there in terms of um, that's where people are going to look. That does not mean that great candidates don't still come through referrals because sure. they do, and you know ultimately. Same for us here, right? If I mean, the folks that work here, they know our business the best, yeah. And so they can be great references for um, from bringing folks for bringing folks in. But um, you know, by and large, though, and depending on where you are in the country, um, you know that that internet ability to go out and track your candidate um, mm-hmm. is is pretty common and is going to allow you to canvas quickly. I think that the uh, I would think that you'd get some when it comes to referrals you get some great referrals because I'm always I'm very selective if I give a referral right. because you know I feel like it totally reflects back upon me um, and so I would think that some of those would be great but at the same time uh, in our industry especially if you're an advisor the referral might be from you know from maybe from a client which right. I think would be I think that would almost be quicksand if you had to like what if that person doesn't work out. 
Are you going to lose a, a, a new employee and maybe a client because he had to let their nephew, cousin, brothers, uncle? Got to think about all those things, right? What uh, I mean, you know, a good candidate can be so valuable to you. And so just keep your mind open. That's what I would mm-hmm. say. Keep your mind open to that. Maybe it's worth having a conversation with the person. But um, ultimately, you know, there's there can be some downsides, right, to hiring mm-hmm. somebody who maybe has some uh, relation or something like that, because that can, you know, create some discomfort to the to the relationship if you ultimately have to let that person go. If only my dad would have heard this podcast in 1994. Would you be sitting here? I don't know. You know, I, I know I don't know what I would be doing. Right. I know Dad would have saved some money there for about four <laughs> years and some heartache. Uh, so w- with that, with that, at at this point. When, when an advisor is starting to go through and screen through all these resumes that are coming in from LinkedIn, from Indeed, any tips, any pointers to pass on to them? So, yeah, I think as you as you start to look, you're, you know, going to look at the person's resume and see what their experience has been and, and looking at how closely that lines up with what you're looking for. Um, you know, things like um, a, uh, a a cover letter used to be really commonplace. Yeah. It's just not as commonplace anymore, although, um, you know, that certainly gives you some ability to see how they write or, or something like that if that ends up being critical to your job description. So, um, but you just don't see that as often mm-hmm. as anymore. I mean, um, you know, frankly, the Indeed process, LinkedIn process, um, it's a little bit more transactional for people, right? They're they're going to go apply for something, and and you'll you know need to kind of look through their information and and just take a close eye to see whether or not you feel like this is something that lines up. You know, I think. Some, you know, if I look back in my career, it used to be that, you know, if you didn't stay with a company for a long period of time, yeah, yeah. that was, you know, sometimes a, you know, a, a, a red flag. I think you have to be realistic to the fact that, um, you know, that that sort of tenure with places a long time mm-hmm. is not quite as common as it used to be. And that isn't necessarily a red flag for somebody. I mean, I think you just have to look at the bigger picture. What do they offer you in terms of their qualifications? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you've reached out to them to do an interview, you know, are they are they creating, you know, barriers to get to that yeah. interview or are they doing whatever they can and understand that a customer service orientation is going to be so critical? I've seen that where people, if they stay put, you know, maybe they'll, they'll advance slowly. But if they job hop, they can... Uh, hop all around the place. You know, a few years ago, uh, I, uh, you know, w- went through a, a I was with, working with an organization that, that did a pretty significant um, merger. And um, at that point, it was five years. Five years was the new norm in terms of how long you stay with a company. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, ultimately people stay where they feel like they belong and where they have opportunity. And so, you know, if you can if you can kind of cross the box or check the box on, on those things, you've got a better, um, you know, chance of, of getting them to, to stay with you. Um, but, you know, people are, they have to look out for themselves too, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, and that's really what you want is somebody who is looking out for their own career because um, somebody who's going to, you know, be accountable for their own career hopefully is going to be accountable for you too. That's a good point. That is a very good point. Okay, so you've screened through. Mm-hmm. You've found a couple folks that you want to uh, have a conversation with. Uh, now it's time to sit across the table from them or virtually, I guess, maybe. Uh, any tip? So let's talk about that. Let's talk about actually sitting down and interviewing. Yeah. Um, what kind of guidance can you give an advisor? So if you actually just go out and Google illegal questions to ask in an interview, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good start. Um, so we, ask those questions. No, oh, no okay, we're going to no, avoid no. those questions, Dennis. <laughs> um, you know, th- those actually give you a, a pretty good snapshot That's of questions that you want to stay away from, and and those are things that are related to age, race, religion. Mm-hmm. Obviously, things mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. you know the law says we can't ask, and um, that don't have any pertinence to the job. So you know, that's a, a good measure to take in terms of arming yourself with. Um, the the legal knowledge of what things you shouldn't ask. But there's also a ton of resources out there around interview questions. Whether you want to ask something that is open-ended, so, you know, Dennis, give me an example of a time, you know, in your career where you made a mistake and how you fixed that. Okay, so when you're asking that question, what are you actually looking for? 
So what you're actually looking for is how does the person think on their feet? Mm -hmm. Do they have, you know, what's most critical to your business? So for, for many of us, for us here at Creative One too, relationship building is a very critical component. And so did the person do the right thing in terms of following through with those values and behaviors, yeah. right, that is ultimately going to positively impact your business? So what you're looking for is how does that person, you know, handle situations um, and, and how are they then able to articulate that back to you? So should you look for questions that aren't like, you know, tell me a time that, you know, tell me one of your weaknesses and then the person says like, you know, I care too much about work or, you know, are, are there, do you use questions that are outside maybe the norm to get a different response? Because that, I mean, those are some common questions that you you yeah, know. I think it's great to answer ask some questions that are a little bit outside the norm um, because you kind of want to see how that person may react in, in different mm -hmm. situations. But you also need to, you know, you can have a, a, a series of questions that you're going to work through with them. And, you know, hopefully you're, you're not only, we call them behavioral event questions, you know, which is what do you do in certain sure. instances. And so you can have a mix of, of questions that, you know, you don't want to hit the hard balls or hit them with the hard stuff each time, right? <laughs> but, um, but you are trying to get a real perspective of how that person is going to manage through situations. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully also you're going to, you know, you want to listen. That the focus of that is for you to listen and learn. But also, you know, for them to ask you questions because you want this to be a good fit for them too. Yeah, yeah. So once you uh, um, you ask the questions, um, your experience so far, like since since COVID, what do you think the uh, the number is as far as in person versus? So I think for most of our advisors, they really still prefer the in person. Um, certainly through COVID, we had to kind of improvise and virtual interviewing can save a lot of time. Yeah, That is, you know, I mean, you may be able to make it happen today, right? As opposed to making mm -hmm. it happen tomorrow or what have you. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to maybe do a first uh, discussion as a virtual, but most advisors in my experience are really going to want to have that face-to-face, -face, you know, experience. And I think they would, you know, I think they would eventually have to because, right? because I can't think of an advisor unless you have a massive office where you're going to have folks that are going to be working remote. That just doesn't seem like a real, a realistic scenario for an advisor. Um, so you do have to see him at some point. But you have that to see him. You want him to come in your office. You want him to understand what the expectations are for that, for your mm -hmm. office. And so, um, yeah, you know, uh, from our perspective here, we still may do a virtual discussion, but we, we want them in here, too. We, we want them to, to see what the culture is of the organization and, um, you know, to also understand the expectation. And if your expectation is that the person is with you on site, uh, every day, then I would, you know, start that out the gate. As a, uh, as, and we're going to go into another episode where we're going to talk a little bit about some HR basics for advisors. Uh, but um, any final uh, do's, don'ts, or hilariously funny stories that you can actually share? I know you have the vow of uh, the vow of secrecy that all HR uh, directors have to take. But um, any I'm do's, any don'ts? You know, I would say the do's are, you know, to keep your mind open, to really listen mm -hmm. to that individual and try to get to know them as much as possible. Um, you know, in terms of the don'ts, I think obviously don't ask questions that are, you know, not not uh, legal in terms of in those now. questions that are going to get you in trouble. But also, you know, once in a while people are going to make a mistake, right? And, mm -hmm. and you've got to figure out how to then navigate through some of that. But I think you know, trying to really look to the person who's going to be the best fit for your culture and um, who you think ultimately is going to be the best connection with your clients is the most critical. I think that's a great point. I, you know, you can find somebody that on paper, that paper has the qualifications, but then the big one is, do I want to have, be, do I want to be around this person eight hours a day? And especially in an advisor's office, it's going to be probably maybe you and this person, maybe you and right. this person and one other person. Right. Um, any red flags that you've experienced through the years where you're just like, nope, flip-flops? Uh, 
Tank tops. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of red flags, uh, you know, over the years. I think it's it's also evolved over the years, yeah. frankly. You know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, business attire has has really evolved. And I think you've got to set that stage for what your, what your team, you know, needs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, not so much that. I think, you know, we're still in a culture where there's a lot of folks who really want that remote component. Yeah. And um, that just doesn't always work in this business. If it does work for you, I know that we've got advisors maybe who who aren't open on Fridays, right? Or they work from home on Fridays. There's different ways that you can mm-hmm. do that. But I think, you know, if you are really, you know, pretty laser focused on, I want to have an experience where my clients have a face to identify with, you know, that's the piece where I think you may have to ask that question more than once to ensure that the individual understands that the expectation is that this is in the office. Gotcha. Gotcha. Perfect. Kelly, I uh, I thank you. This is a very excellent episode. And then we are going to go into a, a part two here um, where we're going to record another one, but we're going to talk about HR basics. So we've discussed hiring, and then we're going to talk about what you do on the next episode, we're going to talk a little bit about those HR policies and setting those things up. So um, for everybody that's out there, uh, remember, of course, that you can catch episodes of The Complete Advisor. Wherever you like to consume podcasts, we're out on YouTube. We've got our great uh, and awesome website where you can actually watch us. Uh, you can you can watch us on some of our episodes on Apple and, and Spotify. But we are everywhere, Kelly. We are even on iHeartRadio. A lot of people don't know that. Makes me kind of nervous. No, don't be nervous. It was a great episode. So, um, yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you subscribe, what ends up happening is uh, you get notified every time we drop a new episode. And then also, if you do get a chance, uh, I would love to hear your comments. Uh, So I look at every comment that comes in, respond. Uh, Any advice, uh, any requests, any constructive criticism, heck, I like it all. So, Kelly, thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Dennis.